Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show, discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Welcome one and all. It is time for the Books That Make You Show. I'm your host, Desiree Duffy, and today we're talking about books that make you Capture our authentic emotions through an autobiographical love story. You know how love often sweeps us into a whirlwind and it can unleash passion and creativity. And some of the best stories of all time are love stories, right? Don't you think? Multi-talented actress, director, and stage producer, Natalia Lazarus has added her autobiographical My Love Affair, Thorns and Roses to her distinguished career. Natalia is also the founder and CEO of the Los Angeles Performing Arts Conservatory and its iconic promenade Playhouse, which she founded in 1996. So I want to find out more about that. My Love Affair, Thorns and Roses, is an alluring and beautiful love story of poetry featuring original Picasso artwork. Now, the book was inspired during a moment in time while she was starring in Jeffrey Hatcher's dramatic two-character play, A Picasso in Paris. The book's heart-wrenching romance, Inverse, reveals moments of love found and lost, from extraordinary joy to extreme sorrow to what I love the best, new beginnings. Natalia, hello. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you so much. So glad to be here. I am excited to talk to you. This book is a a beautiful mixture of things. It's your story and it's framed around a real love story, your autobiographical story, but then it is infused with art and poetry. Can you explain the book? Kind of give us the lay of the land, if you would. The lay of the land. First, it's a series of poems, and they're put in sequential order to tell the love story. Um, Then we added the Picasso artwork to it because the book was inspired when I was working on this play about Picasso, as you said, in Paris. And then when the time came to lay out the book, um, the publisher and the publicist, they were like, this is very clinical, the way you have this table of contents it should be more creative. And I thought, well, what do you mean? What do I do? It's the table of contents. And they said, well, since you're from the theater, why don't you make it acts as opposed to chapters? Call it acts and make it like a playbill of a theater show. And I thought, wow, like I totally understood that, right? Because I understand act one, act two, and Uh, location, setting. So what I think it does now is instead of chapters, you have acts and it tells you the time and the place. And there's a series of poems that go with that. And it just keeps progressing. So it it's like a storybook. It's like a play. And it's got images throughout, which are informing you of the emotional life of that act of that chapter. Oh, I love it. So when you started writing it or putting it together, did you write it in order? Or are these poems and experiences that you pulled together and then laid out to make the story? Yeah, they started out as just, let's call it random. There was no order. It was just, oh, this is how I'm feeling right now. (laughs) But then... I found that just putting them, let's say, in the order of the dates that I had done them gave them an inherent pattern. And then, of course, once we were laying it down to the axe, then you move them around like pieces from the p- a puzzle so that they can tell the story. So now it started out as random sequence, more sequence. <laughs> I love it. Now, and I must confess that Paris is my favorite city. I think Paris is most people's favorite city. If, if you've gone to Paris, you know exactly how just magical and it is. It's just dripping with love and emotion and passion and art. Can you talk about the time that you were there? What was it like for you? Well, I've been going there since I was a child and living there. My father was a diplomat stationed in Paris. 
um, working at the United Nations. So from when I was a teenager, I started to fall in love with Paris and, and everything that it offers, the museums, the buildings, the bridges, the walking, so much beauty. And then as an adult, I started going there and working. And then in this particular time period, I was working on the play about Picasso. And so Picasso lived the majority of his life in France, in Paris, in the south of France. And then the play that I was in is um, a Nazi agent who you then find out she's really Jewish, but she's uh, supposed to destroy Picasso and burn his artwork. And in the play, of course, Mademoiselle Fisher and Picasso live in Paris, and they are in Paris. So everything was surrounding Paris. And then, of course, while I'm there, I meet this wonderful man. (laughs) And it's just, like you said, walking in the gardens, crossing those rivers. It, it, It has a special magic that I don't think can be experienced unless you go there. Yeah, uh, I know exactly what you mean. You're making me want to go go back again. <laughs> um, I was just there last year, um, but it, it, it's totally true. The, the walking through the streets and the people and the food. Oh my God, the food! Um, it's just just amazing. So, yes. can you talk a little bit about your love affair? How did how did that come about? Well, I was doing a presentation of the play. And there was, after the presentation, there was a gentleman who said if I would be interested in doing more presentations, that he would be happy to assist. And, you know, he had a lot of connections and things like that. And then that's how it started. It started as a kind of like a work relationship, but then obviously evolved into a romance. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That happens, definitely. Yes. Why do you suggest that ladies should not be too bossy, but yet know when you have to be a little bit bossy? Can you talk about that? Well, I think it's all in the tone. I know it may sound like a stereotype, but we can say the same thing, exactly what we want to say without having, you know, the militaristic (laughs) uh, tone. And it seems like, I don't know why, uh, perhaps men or maybe all humans that they're they're like pets. <laughs> if you say it nicely, they uh, they listen. But if if you just say it in a, it seems like they shut off, and and an argument can start. Of course, there are the times when you have to lay down the law and just be like, um, no. <laughs> but I would say to to have that be the minimum, not the norm. Excellent. And I work on that all the time. I work on that all the time because it's it's just very easy when we're learning as women to finally come out and stand up for ourselves you want to just do that every time and it can be a little um, shocking and maybe not exactly who you are because maybe you haven't been doing it for so long maybe you've been suppressing or you know complacent and so it's hard to find the balance, I think. And then you slowly try to find that balance of how to, I try to think of it as, I call it like the queen's key. It, you know, if you think of yourself as a diplomat and you are the queen of a kingdom, how would you speak to another country, to another king or queen of another kingdom? Usually you try to keep diplomatic relations. And then if need be, okay, we're going to war. <laughs> It's a good way to look at it. I try to think of it that way. Yes. How would a queen behave? You know, in the pure, pure sense. Of course, everybody has explosions, but that's my best analogy for me. Why do you think Thorns and Roses could be considered a cautionary tale for other women? Well, the, the obvious reason is there's no need to go into a triangulating love affair. The, the affair that you're going to have or the love story that you're going to have should have two people, not three people. And if you put yourself in the position where there's three people, then you're already uh, losing because you're constantly having to compete, um, prove you have angst. 
when is this going to end? When is that other relationship finally, finally ended? You know, paperwork and everything. And it's just a very, um, what I found, it's just very stressful. It may be exciting, but it's exciting in a, in a pathological way. So it, it's not a good exciting. And you don't want to be in that position. You never want to put yourself in a loser position. You want to be in the winning position. And for that, that man should be coming to you. That man or that woman should be coming to you completely available. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's why I think if it's cautionary, you know, if you don't have to go through what I went through, then don't. <laughs> yeah. Just don't. If that man is not 100% available, then don't go there. And it ties into putting yourself in a position where your self-esteem, you don't want to be considered second best because that can do something to the psyche as well, right? Yes, exactly. By be, You said it uh, well, by putting yourself in a position of second best, it's working on your psyche and your self-esteem. And you don't want that. You need, you need to put yourself in first position. <laughs> and, Absolutely. Yeah, because if not, it's a... Uh, and then all that insecurity is going to come out. So whatever was attractive of you, or at least that was my experience, whatever was attractive of you to that man, because you were confident and exuberant and uh, intelligent, whatever, all these things, magical things, all of a sudden, as it starts to wear and wear and wear, all of a sudden, you're you're kind of like not like that anymore. You're not perceived that way anymore because you're like, <laughs> and um, yeah. I make that parallel with um, one of Picasso's muses, Dora Maar, who was an artist in her own right in Paris. She was a photographer, a painter, and that's exactly what he loved about her, her energy, her strength, her creativity. But then when she got involved with him for nine years, he never let go of his previous relationships. So it was always turmoiled until in the end, you know, it didn't have a good ending for her, unfortunately. But yeah. she got destroyed. Her, her, her self-esteem and her ego, her creativity, everything got destroyed because she didn't get out in time. Yeah, it's just like it's it sucks away your energy. It's like a vampire just taking away the best part of yourself. Yes. Do you feel that, you know, when you talk about Picasso and the play and his story and did that mirror in many ways your real life, especially when you look back and can reflect on it? Yes, it was a very such an interesting time period for me creatively and emotionally because they were tied in so every night I'm doing this play about this woman that's in love with Picasso but she has to destroy him and it's a love that can never be and then in real life I'm having this love story which in the end obviously was a love that could never be so it was they were intertwined all those emotions yeah they were connected <laughs> I love those the same. Yeah, those those moments in life where things mirror each other, it just makes it seem so profound and poignant and meaningful, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Very meaningful. <laughs> I, I, I'm getting shivers thinking about you know, listening to you and thinking about it. That just seems like so magical. Um, let's and that was the beauty for me is that even though it was um, in the moment of the breakup when I knew I had to walk away that I felt such sadness but in the end it was enriching to my life and I'm, yeah. I'm grateful for that you know that's the thing you can't be afraid of those experiences either because then it gives you it, it gives you this amazing book right it gives you a new infusion of creativity um yeah <laughs> what about thoughts for finding the love that you deserve what would you suggest to women in finding the love they actually deserve that's right um from what i've experienced is you you just let go of any preconceived notion of whatever you know what i see is sometimes um women making lists or we have a an idea in our mind and just letting go 
of any preconceived notion and focusing on what you're doing. What is your work? That's what is your mission in life? How are you serving uh, people, art, community, whatever it is? I think it starts with defining who you are and what your kingdom is. And what I said earlier, realizing that you are the queen of this kingdom. And if you just focus on that, things will start to come to you. Suitors will come to you. Kings, princesses, whatever. They're not all going to be the right one. But the idea is you're going to start to look at the selection as opposed to just one. And just exercising what it is to have communication. So Sometimes a friend will say, oh, I, I just, I don't think I like him. I said, but just go, go on the date, communicate, mm -hmm. have fun. Um, not every man on the instinct, are you going to be like, oh, I absolutely desire this man. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes things build. So you have to give it a chance. So that that's what I would say. I think the main thing is making sure that you focus on something other than finding this man. The yeah. man will find you. The man will find you. Exactly, exactly. And sometimes if you have that instant passion, love at first sight, call it what you will, then that a lot of times is just based on emotion. And like you're saying, there's a lot of other factors to consider because um, you don't want to be necessarily finding those frogs in your kingdom right <laughs> yes or at least you want to def know that they are and move them along yeah yeah, yeah. get out of here you little toad <laughs> move them along i mean long-term relationships i think um for love that we deserve it's somebody that's going to serve you be there for you for your needs to help you to guide you to support you i mean my my fiance right now he tells me i am here to make you happy Aww. i mean it's just that's wonderful as it should be <laughs> exactly yes C can we segue over and talk a little bit about creating and running your own company and some of the principles that have guided you oh god that's a big one <laughs> creating your own company. And that's how I've come up with this um, parallel, with this metaphor. Mm -hmm. For a while, I, I believe when you're, when you're first starting your own business on your own, you're kind of just like swimming, figuring things out. How do I do this? Um, especially if, you know, you don't have a master's in business and you have, a, <laughs> you know, degrees in theater and cinema, but the main thing I've discovered is you stay true to what you know, what you feel an expert at, and you outline that and you commit to that. You don't worry about what other people are doing or statistics or all of that. You worry about your vision and getting what you need done. And that's the only thing that has guided me is my instincts what I know, obviously, um, and pursuing. Just persist, 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 and don't give up. And there will be hard times. Um, and there will be times when you're like, oh, my God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Because you have a huge responsibility. You have uh, location, staff, payroll. Uh, in the case of the conservatory and the theater, we have a lot of government paperwork for immigration so that foreign students can come in with the Bureau of Education because I decided to make it a degree-granting institution. Then once it became a degree-granting institution, it had to be nationally accredited. So there's all these other things that you maybe didn't realize. That's also what I've learned. Like, oh, <laughs> I remember my mother, she said, uh, back many years ago, but daughter, you are creating university. How are you going to do by yourself? And I just thought, what? <laughs> I never, I, it's not like I said, oh, I'm going to create a university. I said, I'm going to create a place for artists, right? Okay, maybe one in the same, but it, it got more defined. And then I learned what other paperwork. So it, it's a big journey, but if it's your, if it's something that you have, passion about and that you know about 
you're going to enjoy that far more than having to report to work every day at some job that you don't really like. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always struck by the saying, um, if you don't build your dream, somebody else is going to hire you to help you build theirs. You know, when I heard that a while, yeah. And it's just like, it's true. And if you're fine working for a company and helping somebody build their vision, that's great. I applaud people for that. But it feels, Natalia, like when you're doing it for yourself, you know, all of the, the pain and the paperwork and, you know, the rules and regulations. Yeah, it's really, really hard, but it feels so much more fulfilling. Yeah, I think, I mean, I can only speak for artists, but I feel one thing that has always stayed for me is your voice, your vision will be stronger than anything else. It, you, an artist's voice is so strong. We have so much to say that there is, there's just no other way but to say it, do it, paint it, sing it. And, and that's what we do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I have to imagine too, that in building your um, theater company, in a lot of ways, the organizational design of that very much mimics what it's like to put on a production because you are planning, there's schedules, there's timelines, there's actors, there's, you know, so many different components. It seems like in many ways that gave you a firm basis for building it as a company too, because it's a lot of the same components. Exactly. Exactly. It's a, uh... That's what I mean. It, you know, I worked for many years on on television and on the stage, and I still do. And mm-hmm. when I go and work for other companies, so I don't mind that. But I know that I'm always coming back to my place. <laughs> I always yeah. have my place. But it's it's from those experiences. If you have that kind of organizational mind, that oh, okay, well, I'm doing this anyways over here, so I can structure it here and be the boss. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. What advice do you have for young women, perhaps women who are pursuing a creative career, an actor, or poetry, or whatever? What what kind of advice might you give to young women today? Well, there's so many different types of advice, but I would say, so the first one that comes to mind is creatively, just continue to pursue your creativity, continue to pursue what you believe in and, and, and just keep going, whether it's auditions, keep going on them, you know, something's going to click. It's a numbers game. (laughs) Keep making yourself better, figure out what are your weaknesses, your strengths, train, get a coach and keep just like an athlete. I always say that Mm -hmm. an athlete trains, right? They don't, win magically. (laughs) They train, train, train. So it's the same thing when you're an artist. If you're not working on something, then study it, create your own. As a, and for business wise, because it's hard, right? As, as an artist, how to balance. So I always say, try to find if you, if you're not, you know, independently wealthy, uh, and maybe even if you are, maybe you want to find an additional job but that is creative that that suits that suits your needs so maybe it's at an art gallery maybe it's at a concert hall um as opposed to oh i'm going to go work at the bank yeah. find something that is parallel and in your preference i always say also are if we're if you're an artist you probably have more than one skill so if you're an actor you're probably also maybe a singer or a comedian or a painter or a dancer we all have at least two or three, right? So mm-hmm. try to find something in, in, in that vein because that will feed your soul as opposed to take energy away from you. Yeah, exactly. And exactly like you did. Is there something, Natalia, that you discovered about yourself while writing your book? <laughs> that I'm human and vulnerable and make dumb mistakes. (laughs) I mean, it's, you know, when you're an actor, you, you play these roles. And then as a human being, you try to think you have it all together. 
especially when people are looking at you because you're you're the boss, you're a director. But then to have been so vulnerable, and I call it naive, and maybe it was a, maybe I feel it was a lesson to learn. You always hear of this, oh, it's a coming of age story, a coming of age story. Well, for me, it was a coming of age story at a late age. You know, like, it's about time. <laughs> um, I think I needed to grow up as a woman. And I think that that relationship and that lesson really made me do that because it, I was left like flat on my back parallel. So there was the Picasso story. There's the love story. And right when the love story ended, there was something tragic that happened to my company uh, by a, you know, a, a person working beneath me. I mean, it was tragic. It was going to like, close everything down and so I was left literally with my face in the mud I had to pick myself up work like mad to recover and save the company and and that's when I realized you know what you can't be so vulnerable and so focused on another person that you forget everything else about you to the point that it could be detrimental. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I believe in love and all of that, but you can't be so much that you lose all, you know, logic and sense. And it, it's a sense of desperation. And I don't think that's healthy. So I learned, I think I learned a lot. I learned, um, I, I, I became a woman and stopped having childish fantasies and, and, and of finding love in the wrong places and understanding that love is around and it will come tempt you, but it's what is the love that you deserve? What's yeah. not pathological, what, you know, not addictive. What is, what is the one that you deserve? That will usually be one that is with the least amount of drama. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is so. such a great statement. The love that you deserve. Is there a specific poem or verse or line in your book that resonates with you the most? Which one is, I don't know if it's fair to say, pick your favorite, but which one is your favorite? <laughs> well, I have favorites for different reasons because the book has such a trajectory, right? It goes from joy to desperation to recovery and overcoming. So probably I would have a favorite in each section, but I think my favorite one is probably towards the end, which is about, I, I will overcome, I will thrive, I will overcome, basically, you know, I will survive. But um, let me have, see it directly for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and the book cover is beautiful, too. It's really just a lovely presentation all the way around. Oh, thank you. Yes, the the cover, the photographer is a legendary photographer, Harry Langdon, who, if you look up, he was a legend, 80s, 90s. Uh, we practically got him out of retirement. Uh, <laughs> he was in Palm Springs and he came over and did this for us. It's, uh, he's amazing. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. And that's, and that's just one of the, uh, every photo he took was amazing. Um, yes, so it's called To the Future. Mm. And one of the verses in it, in spite of all you said, cheers, for I will rise, I will flourish, I will be successful in spite of all you said, there is no turning back as other journeys begin. Ah, I love that. I love that, Natalia. That's beautiful. Thank yes. you for sharing that. Yeah, that's, I think, the one in terms of human growth, that's the best, you know. I will yeah. rise. I will flourish. Can you tell everyone where they can go to find out more about you, find the book, social media? Let us know your details. Yes. So my website is Lazarus on Stage. <laughs> Very easy. My last name, Lazarus on Stage. The book can be found on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, um, 
I think those three. <laughs> and yes, you can find me on social media with my with my name, Natalia Lazarus. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your book with us. I appreciate it, Natalia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You bet. And thank you, everybody, for joining us as well. You can find out more on our website. That's booksthatmakeyou.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Don't forget to subscribe to our Webby Award-winning newsletter so you can always find out about the latest shows. And we do book giveaways and book news and everything that book lovers really love are in there. Until next time, all of my bookish friends, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The host and executive producer of the Books That Make You Show is Desiree Duffy. Sound mastering and engineering by Dave Napox. Social media and content promotion by Siddhi Jahagirdar. Copywriting and editing by Mike Robinson. The Books That Make You Show is an award-winning podcast produced by Black Chateau Enterprises.